listening to Observer AM. to Observer AM on Radio 911 FM. We're following developments in the UK. You know that's a big story that uh, people have been following worldwide because uh, protests have been erupting uh, throughout uh, the UK. As a matter of fact, I think it's more accurate to uh, describe it as uh, riots. Because what actually happened on Thursday, if you had not, if you have not heard, a week ago, uh, a black man uh, was shot um, during a police operation, and that um, caused uh, really a lot of concern in uh, one community in the UK, and uh, they marched to a local police, a police station to get answers. And uh, that really is when things went south. And since then, a uh, riot actually broke out at that point. And since then, uh, youth across the UK, various communities across the UK, uh, this is not just London, they have uh, been rioting, looting. And this um, has caused a lot of concern, not just uh, in terms of, of, of getting that under control. We've seen that various officials have had to come back from holiday. We've seen that Parliament has been called called back from holiday senior other senior officials have been called back from holiday to deal with this and there's a concern not just for the Nottingham carnival but uh, what does this mean implications in terms of the for the implications uh, of the hosting of the Olympics coming up in a matter of months well a lot of people have been offering their perspective of what has been going on in the UK, what has been going right, what has been going wrong. And two people who have been doing so, uh, UK resident Mina Salami, who is a specialist in writing, researching, and consulting on Africa and diasporic culture and lifestyle. She joins us live from the UK. Good morning, Mina. Hi, Anika. Hello. And uh, also joining us is an is a academic, entrepreneur, pilot, musician, martial arts expert and public speaker Nathaniel Peets. He joins us as well. Good morning to you. Good morning. It's great to be with you. Okay. Or should I say, um, perhaps it's probably afternoon by now there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, it's the afternoon, but for your listeners there, good morning. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad that you're able to join us and really give us an underground perspective as to, to, to what's happening. And Mina, perhaps you can start us off first. Uh, you know, people have been asking a lot of questions as to whether or not this can be classified as a racial issue or some other type of issue? How would you classify what's happening in the UK right now? That's a very important question. And um, I would say that it isn't a racial issue. Um, we've seen that, uh, you know, in the footage that has been made available, that the, the looters are, in fact, um, you know, of various ethnicities and backgrounds. However, there is a racial element um, that I think is important to acknowledge. Um, you know, it, it, obviously the riots were ignited by the, the murder of a black man. Um, you know, it has to do with anger of police brutality, a long history of police brutality. There's certainly a, a racial element um, that is involved here and, you know, one that is, it is important to acknowledge that, I believe. There's been a lot of discussion uh, since this incident. It's really brought to the fore issues concerning police and how they deal with uh, people of different ethnicities. Uh, Nathaniel, as, as, as a black man in London, what is your perception of the police and how they handle uh, these issues? Well, um, I, mean, I, I speak in, um, in very different capacities. I'm also the director of a youth organization which deals um, with the profile of young people that we're speaking of that have caused these riot, riots. Um, as a black youth, very cognizant of the realities many of these young people face growing up in the inner city area of London as a black man um, and seeing the harassment which we face from police and being stopped when we become successful, they stop us. And um, recently, uh, I'd say in the last two, three years, they've stepped up their stop and search policy, which they've had here in Britain. Um, and um, 
what they what they have been doing is searching youth um, because of the way they dress. They believe that might be carrying weapons and knives and of course what this has done it is it has created it's created a perception amongst the members of the public as well as a perception in the youth that the police are against them this social unrest has been resting with them for a long time and uh, they have expressed their concerns to various youth workers and grassroots organizations that they don't like the police they don't like being harassed and as a black man, I mean, growing up in Britain, um, I, I myself have experienced institutionalized racism. It, it is kind of, it's there, it's an undertone, but uh, just to move away from the racial issue, um, the issues here are far greater than race. Um, there are social issues um, such as poverty, illiteracy, and various other things. And uh, youth within Britain have had a breakdown in the moral the moral standing we found within strong, you know, families and um, young people on the whole, not just black youth, but across the whole spectrum of youth. Uh, there, it's not a black issue, it's not a racial issue here in Britain, it's a youth issue. Uh, there's been a breakdown in society and in fact it's quite sick uh, with this disease of underachievement and uh, uh, lack of respect and also disadvantaged uh, backgrounds. So it seems then that the undertone could be argued as being a clash between freedom of expression and uh, the, the, the responsibilities of police officers. Let me just uh, elaborate. I say that because uh, it, can be, it could be seen that, yes, um, young people have a right to express themselves um, through whatever way they, they see fit. And one way of expression could be through clothing. And where one person may see it as a freedom of expression to dress a particular way, wear your pants baggy, wear hooded clothing, things to cover, conceal your, your face and so on, to, to someone in law enforcement, couldn't it be argued then that, you know, that person is suspicious because they look like they're trying to, to conceal or hide something? Yes, I mean, I'd most certainly agree with that. And this is why we're trying to change the perceptions um, uh, of the police. And also we try to help the young people to show them how to dress properly and better, um, how to not make themselves look like they are targets. And it's important that we, we really separate um, youth here because um, the youth that have caused these riots are young people with the intent to cause damage. These are youth that are known to the police, that have been in problem, that do come from deprived backgrounds. There is conscious just thought attached to what they're doing. They want to resist the police. They want. To, they wanted to cause violence. They wanted to loot. They wanted to uh, steal the items and sell it on the black market. There is that category of young people. And then you have the category of youth also that as to to not be seen to be weak by their peers and their friends what they will do then or even be attacked by their friends what they will do is dress in that way uh, which seems to be this gangster type of mentality wearing the baggy jeans the treat you know the trousers hang down low and you know the bounce walk and the gold tooth that they put in you know the cap and, and cutting their eyebrows and having these hairstyles which which look um, you know aggressive and come from that gangster um, you know uh, type of uh, way of dressing or even doing their hair uh, appearance. Now, um, those young people which dress that way, some of them dress that way to prevent themselves being a victim from other young people that might want to rob them. And, uh, and so they, it's important that we really kind of draw a line in the separation between these youth. The youth that are out there have caused the riots are young people that um, have the intent to do it, and conscious thought is attached to that. And like the other youth, which um, uh, are, not, are not as bad, but are influenced very strongly and heavily by their friends. So that's that, that as well. That, mm -hmm. uh, oh, sorry. No, I, go I, ahead. I kind of would like to say that I don't think we should uh, simultaneously um, there's a lot of emphasis whenever things like this happen on what young people are listening to or wearing and all these things that apply to the youth culture um, the, the problem with that is that you, youth dress and culture will always exist and you have other groups who also dress in a, in a sort of stand outish kind of way you know you have punk and grunge and all kinds of trends which may be intimidating um, in their own ways however i think the, the real issue at hand is that between um, 1998 and 2010 i believe i was just reading a report about 333 um, black people have died in police custody um, and not a single police officer has been convicted for any any such death so um, the, the problem when it comes to the relationship with the law enforcement um, I, I believe has quite little to do with how young people dress and with other kinds of cultural clashes.
Now, I, I would most say, uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I mean, I, I, I understand exactly where you're, you're, you're coming from with that. Um, I wanted to just to, to hone in a little bit on the, the, the diaspora element of it, though. Um, we've heard that there's some groups that have come forward to, 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 to counter or to clean up or do whatever they can uh, in this in this difficult time. Um, have the diaspora or can the diaspora mobilize um, their people in order to see what can be done to counter what's happening right now? I think certainly by speaking up against similar problems which which many countries are faced with this is not an uh, an isolated issue in that we're dealing with elements of with racial elements with class elements with poverty um you know all these kinds of social structures which are very relevant in certainly in developed countries where we have um you know immigration and different ethnicities living together but everywhere across the diaspora uh, um, i think certainly by by speaking up about these kinds of issues and in in perhaps in an attempt to understand the root causes and prevention of similar riots taking place anywhere else um i think it is important that that an international dialogue um, between diasporans occurs certainly no. Yeah, I um, go right ahead. I go just, right ahead, Nathaniel. Yeah, no. To follow up from what was said there, um, I, I'm aware of uh, various different diaspora groups from the Caribbean linking up, um, uh, such as the Caribbean Enterprise Network. We have businesses which have engaged in collectively coming together to assist with this. Also, the Jamaican diaspora with uh, the UK Future Leader Movement as well, uh, getting together to to assist and um, help with. No. So um, the diaspora is is engaged, and um, the uh, the people here. It's a it's a big concern for us that um, we are not as black people living in uh, the in the in the United Kingdom, especially that uh, that we are not represented, and that the media does not uh, create the perception across the UK that this is a black issue. Um, and uh, we're we're working quite strongly, in fact, to try to um, show that. It is not a black problem, but it's a youth problem because many times black people are misrepresented in the media. And just I echo um, um, I echo what Amina was, uh, was saying there in terms of the uh, the police and uh, and uh, the inquiries which need to uh, be put into how police handle certain things. I mean, uh, Smiley Culture was was is a, a prominent uh, reggae uh, artist in, in Britain, and uh, he died, um, you know, in police custody as well. And uh, there's there's so many things and so many issues which um, are in institutions, and uh, this is the next level that we, within the diaspora community in Britain, have to try to engage to fix these problems and, and, this, and uh, really, really find out what's going on and uh, why people have not been brought to justice. And in terms of diaspora politicians, I'd, mm-hmm. I'd like to quickly mention that um, the, I'm Nigeria, of Nigerian heritage and the Nigerian president, good luck, Jonathan, who has become known as the Facebook president in, in our country because of his Facebook activity, this morning did post a statement about solidarity um, across uh, sort of international solidarity in terms of figuring out how to avoid these kinds of events so i think i think it is influencing even such prominent leaders across the the globe what um, i i i I don't know what uh, the extent is of the reporting actually in london but here watching it from the outside in i don't hear a lot about parents and uh, their involvement or lack thereof because it seems to me that there are a lot of youth who are out there and they're the ones involved in these rights but we don't really hear a lot about their parents what they have to say and 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 really what kind of role they could play in in curtailing the situation who wants to take a a shot at that question well um i mean i I don't mind uh i don't mean talking about that i mean um in my organization we try to do parent intervention youth intervention also teacher intervention um to try to get all sides communicated now there's been a real breakdown in the family structure here in britain uh, whereby you have single parent families um that you know came up in the in the 80s and uh these single parent families uh, have children the children which are teens themselves at age 15 having children and so you've got children raised 
raising children. And there's about three generations of that. Three children, raising children, who are now raising children. And these are the parents of the children that have grown up in these broken homes. Um, they have no more moral standards. Um, the parents themselves need to be taught how to be parents. I mean, for myself and, and probably for everybody and most of your listeners, um, is, you know, the moral standards, respect for your elders, uh, you know, mutual love for one another. These are things which are commonplace in our lives. However, for many of these youth and for many of their parents, that is something that is so foreign to them. They've never had it. And it's a generation uh, now of young people that are coming out of brokenness. And so those parents, some of them, in fact, I know for a fact, um, were out there with their children uh, along, uh, gro- driving in cars and looting as well alongside their youth. Um, and such reports came from the north of England and in Manchester and Nottingham. And, uh, and so you find that there is a brokenness, not just within the young people that are there, but there's deep issues embedded in social unrest also with their parents themselves. And uh, so this is, uh, this is, the, this is the state of, of the parents and probably why you haven't heard uh, too much in terms of the parents, uh, you know, grabbing hold of the kids and keeping them in uh, because they themselves have got deep social issues. So in some instances, obviously not all, but in some instances, parents are, are very much involved. That's what you're saying. Yes, that's right. That's right. And not all. I mean, it's, uh, it, uh, some parents may be involved and other parents have just lost it, whereby the young people that are engaged, that they no longer live with their mum and dad or they'll be living in foster care. So it's actually the guardians which, which are responsible for them. And uh, these young people have been engaged in the police. They have no... Um, control over their young people and, and it, uh, you know, for many of them it's been that way since these young people have been 8 years old, even 7 years old and, and been in trouble with the police and, and getting what you call antisocial behaviour orders from the police at such a young age and um, the youth themselves running riot from since they were young and, and now they're teenagers and they're 16 and 17 years old and of course with 10 years worth of disrespect and no respect for their parents at, or their foster guardians um, uh, you know, uh, these, these young people are just running, running riot. To add what thing I was just said, which I believe is absolutely correct, I think, you know, we're still in the early days of the aftermath of these riots, and I'm sure that a lot of stories will emerge where, in fact, a lot of parents um, probably will have intervened and made sure that their children stayed at home. Um, after all, it's only a tiny fraction of the youth that were out rioting and looting. And secondly, I, I, however, I do think that I, I, I kind of think that there are three problems or three root causes to these riots and to the looting. And um, those are causes which have to do with race and which have to do with spending cuts and which have to do with the class structure um, of which the UK has the most divided class structure in all of the developed countries in the world. Um, and these are problems that affect the parents of these youths as well. So they would have been picking up perhaps on anger and resentment with regard to these issues in their homes. Um, so, of course, there's also that element to this where the youth and their parents feel an anger at the, the social system and the, and the failures of the social system that we live in. Now, I'm just wondering, yes, you're right when you say that, you know, it's still fairly early. But what are some of the lessons that we can learn from this? Well, I mean, uh, well, the, the lessons... That, oh, sorry, go ahead, Amina, sorry. I'd say that the, the, the lesson that we can learn, and we haven't learned it yet, um, but there is there are important lessons that we can learn, but we can only do so if we begin to have a dialogue about what may have caused these issues. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the, the measures that are taken, which I understand are short-term measures, but they're quite um, draconian military um, reaction and response from the politicians in the UK. Um, these are the short-term measures, but in order to, to find um, or to, to learn valuable lessons from this, I think we're going to, it's going to require a, a dialogue of, of the root causes here. Nathaniel? Yeah. I would, I would most certainly agree with that, and I, I mean, uh, with my organisation, the Safety Box, which um, delivers a lot of youth intervention at, at grassroots level, we engaged in the previous government with quite a lot of um, dialogue um, with the previous government that was 
um, in terms of providing services for young people. And uh, what what has taken place is that this is this, what the reason for a lot of this, I believe, is that uh, they've stripped away many of the youth service provisions, such as the Connections Organisation, which was a a, a, a government initiated scheme to which young people could get advice on careers development. They would have, you know, courses on CV writing, on resume development, on leadership skills, on interview techniques and so forth. This service is completely gone now due to budget cuts. Other such things where as youth services, youth centers and faith groups would get funding and money to run private organization um, development courses and youth development life skill programs that would run through youth centers, the money for that has gone as well. And I think um, the solutions that we need to make now have to be long-term rather than reactive, which uh, uh, has been commented on already. And the only, the only way this can be fixed is with, is, is with engagement with the police again, as we had before, and the grassroots organizations communicating directly with the police and with the government, and that they make policies not from the authoritarian position, but they make policies based upon listening to the young people and also listening to grassroots organizations. You, you feel as though the police are the enemy, and that is a, that has been created because of the lack of communication between the officers and between the community. And the, the stereotypes have been formed on both sides of the fence. The police stereotyping the young people and the young people stereotyping the police. And as such, because of the lack of dialogue, um, because of that breakdown of communication, um, this has happened and uh, the perceptions have been negative, uh, a negative view of each other. And um, just to reinforce what I said before, that dialogue needs to be uh, reopened again because we did engage before and they need to begin once again to communicate with grassroots organizations and instead of pulling money away from it and cutting provisions, trying to put money back in to building tomorrow's leaders. The most dangerous thing on the street is not the gun, it is not the knife. The most dangerous street on the thing on the street is the mind. And if we can get into the minds of young people through the education system and through youth development, then I think that we'll be able to create a much stronger and more powerful nation with the youth supporting the police and supporting the government, being respectful and abiding by the laws. Nathaniel, as you're talking about perception, uh, you know, a, a question that came into our studio um, had to do with the statistics uh, dealing with the number of persons, um, black individuals, who have been killed while in police custody. Do you have um, any such statistics? Um, I don't have the statistics uh, at the moment. Um, no, I, I've got the... Do you have on the IPCC website, which is... Um, uh, I don't have the website information right now, but mm-hmm. I, I did read that it was um, 333 people of color that have been killed in police custody between 1998 and 2010. And so then um, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming then that would help to fuel certain perceptions then of the police. That's right. Most oh, definitely. absolutely. Uh, There's definitely a long history of, um, of police brutality towards people of color in, in the UK. And the, the fact that none of no police officers have ever faced any conviction um, I, don't, I don't know what the causes of these deaths have been, per se, but th- th- that indicates that there is a problem. Finally now, uh, and I'll give you, Nathaniel, the last word. You spoke about the fact that there needs to be dialogue. Do you see, or are you optimistic that coming out of these riots that we could see uh, community-based organizations having meaningful dialogue with, 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 with government entities and the police to see how we can deal with some of these issues? Well, it's it's a shame that it takes it takes something like this for them to listen to what we've been saying for the past year and a bit. Um, it's a shame that it, it has caused such a enormous impact, and so many families and people's lives have been ruined for them to say, "Okay, now we need to listen." Um, yes, they are going to open. I mean, I've got a, I've got a meeting tomorrow with Ed Miliband, who's the leader of the opposition, um, and so the politicians are beginning to engage with community members because they recognise that the cost of obviously repairing all of this damage um, is going to be significantly more incarcerating all these criminals than for them to put money back into youth services and youth provisions. Uh, the cost in incarcerating a criminal 
know, one criminal is, is quite heavy and they could easily put that money into youth development programs, charities, social enterprises and schools which run programs for youth that are at risk of offending and young people that are in real development. There was a statement that was written once by somebody. He said, give me the minds of your youth and I will create a nation. Now, if we can invest in these organizations that deliver and help with youth development, then I'm sure that many of these problems that exist um, will be few and far between. And they need to start listening. And I'm happy that uh, at least the leader of opposition uh, on Friday has gathered most of the community leaders and members to meet to discuss how we might be able to go forward in long-term solutions to the problem. We're live from London today talking about the London riots and talking about the cause and really what we can do to move forward. Thank you so much to Mina Salami and to Nathaniel Peets for joining us on Observer AM. Thank you. And for those of you who want uh, information on those statistics, you can actually check the Independent Police Complaint. Independent Police Complaints Commission. It is www.ipcc.gov.uk. Observer AM continues with your big stories. From Observer Media, the big stories, not just news. It's the big stories. Next, the big stories on Observer Radio. Listen and learn.